Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Sarah Anschütz will defend the academic thesis, Young Lives on the Move, the Mobility Trajectories and Transnational Affective Engagements of Ghanian Background Youth Living in Belgium. May I now invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Highly esteemed Prorector and Committee members, the supervisors, family, friends and colleagues. It is my pleasure to share the main results of my dissertation with you, which is called The Mobility Trajectories and Transnational Effective Engagements of Ghanaian Background Youth Living in Belgium. So first, let's talk about this title, because it's not something that you would normally hear. And I would like to take it step by step. This dissertation is first and foremost about young people's mobility trajectories. This is a term that refers to all of the different geographical moves that young people make throughout their lives. It includes changes in residence, migration moves and travel, and also the different family constellations that result from all of these moves. While previous research has paid a lot of attention to the impact of migration, studies on migrant youth usually do not pay attention to their mobility. They assume that young people are quite immobile. Migrant youth are understood as having moved once in their lives, or not at all if they were born to migrant parents. But to illustrate that it's actually quite remarkable what we can learn and what we can see when we pay attention to all of the movements that young people make, I would like to tell you a little bit more about one of the research participants. Nana was born in Ghana, and throughout her childhood, she moved between different households and lived with different caregivers. At the age of 11, she then moved to Belgium to reunite with her father, while all the other caregivers stayed behind in Ghana. Once Nana finished her education in Belgium, she then returned to Ghana twice and for various purposes, for example, to visit family and friends or to go on vacation. So if you look at Nana's mobility map, it actually looks a little bit more like this. And Nana's story is not unique. Migrant youth are very mobile and trips to the country of origin are really common among young people with a migration background in Europe. Studies show that up to 97% of migrant youth in several European countries have visited the country of origin at least once, and many actually visit on a regular basis. So considering that 20% um, of migrant youth across the European Union has a migration background, travel to the country of origin is actually the reali reality for millions of young people in Europe. You might wonder why it is even important to look at all of this mobility of migrant youth. And this brings me to the second term in my title, transnational effective engagements. Put simply, this term refers to the interactions and experiences that young people have with specific people and places because of their mobility. This includes what young people see during their visits, what they hear, what they smell, but also what they learn and how all of these experiences make them feel. To come back to the example of Nana, I had the pleasure to accompany her on one of the trips that she made. She shared her excitement when she felt the heat of Ghana when we, when we left the plane. I could observe her enjoyment when we hung out with her friends. I could see her um, curiosity about Ghana and also the confidence and the ease with which she, um, um, with, with which she traveled around the country. And all of this is what I refer to as transnational effective engagements in the dissertation. Such a focus on emotions and experiences in Ghana is important be because it affects young people's um, relationships with others, their personal development, and also their future pathways. It is within this backdrop that my dissertation investigates the following research question. How does the physical mobility to and within Ghana shape the transnational effective engagements of Ghanaian background youth living in Belgium? To answer this question, I conducted um, 18 months of ethnographic research, and this included hanging out with young people, um, engaging in small talk, conducting interviews, making observations in schools, in church settings, in participants' homes in Belgium, 
but also when I um, spent time with some of the participants in Ghana. Additionally, I used tools um, that were specifically designed for this project and which ultimately resulted in the mobility maps that you also saw earlier. The sample included 25 young people who were born to Ghanaian parents and are currently residing in Belgium. All of the research participants had made at least one international move to or from Ghana. Just to give you a little bit more of context, my research is part of the so-called MOTRA project, which is an international research project that investigates how mobility impacts the life chances of Ghanaian background youth in various countries. And my research relates to the Belgian case study. I will now move to the three analytical chapters of this dissertation. Each of these chapters zoom into different aspects of young people's mobility and explore how these shape young people's um, experiences of growing up between Belgium and Ghana. The first analytical chapter of my dissertation takes a closer look at how the mobility of Ghanaian background youth contribute to their understanding of family and how this understanding in turn impacts experiences of family reunification. According to family reunification laws and policies in many European countries, migrants can bring their spouse and any minor children um, to the destination country. Family thus only refers to the nuclear family and family reunification is understood as something that takes place in the destination country context. Yet by following young people's mobility trajectories, this chapter brings into focus young people's changes between households in Ghana and the resulting different care arrangements. Let's return to Nana. Throughout her childhood, uh, throughout her childhood in Ghana, she lived with her mother, her maternal grandmother, her maternal aunts, a teacher and fellow church member, her father and her stepmother. Moving between households allowed young people to form emotional connections to multiple kin and non-kin caregivers over time. And many of these caregivers also remained important later in life. Family can thus include caregivers beyond the biological parents that young people accumulate over time. This also means that when a young person migrates to Belgium to, re to reunite with one or even with both parents, family reunification can still be experienced as a separation from the perspective of the young person because um, he or she leaves behind a significant other in Ghana. Young people can also experience multiple separations and reunifications in both the origin and the destination country. This chapter thus demonstrates that policy definitions of family reunification that are centered on the nuclear family and on the destination country context are only one way to look at the phenomenon and they do not always coincide with how young people experience this. The second analytical chapter investigates how travel to the country of origin affects young people's personal growth. The chapter first shows that previous research looks differently at mobility of young people with and without a migration background. Visits to the country of origin are usually investigated in terms of migrant youth's sense of belonging and ethnic identity. By contrast, the mobility of youth without a migration background in the context of international student mobility, of travel and tourism, um, usually is studied through a, what I call a personal growth lens that highlights the, personal, the positive personal impacts of mobility. This chapter argues that there's actually no reason to make a distinction or to look differently at the mobility of young people with and without a migration background, which is why I then analyze visits to the country of origin um, in terms of the personal growth benefits. The chapter shows that Ghanaian background youth gain self-confidence and develop their educational and career aspirations in various ways. To give you an example, young people were treated respectfully, which con contributed to their self-confidence. And young people had the chance to learn about inspir inspiring historical figures or interact with um, successful role models 
who could give them new ideas about how their own lives might unfold in the future. Acknowledging the personal growth benefits of country of origin visits has broader implications. Schools and public debates in many European countries consider such trips to disadvantage young people with a migration background by negatively impacting their emotional well-being um, or their educational performance. At the same time, international student mobility and travel are usually praised for their transformative potential. This dissertation shows that it is important to consider other types of mobility beyond student exchange programs, because if we look at visits to the country of origin through a personal growth lens, we see that also these, uh, this type of mobility is enriching and provides access to resources. Finally, the last analytical um, chapter explores how young people of a Ghanaian background use their mobility and their smartphones to create connections to people and places in Ghana, and how these are experienced before, during, and after visits. To analyze this, I developed the concept of extraordinary everydayness, which refers to the extraordinary nature of experiencing an everydayness, but with previously unknown people and in an unfamiliar space. This concept is helpful to explore young people's practices that shape their connection to the country of origin. Following young people's mobility trajectories, I investigate the work that young people put into creating transnational peer relationships on social media platforms before they visit Ghana. Nana, for example, used Twitter to seek out people she thought were interesting both personally, but also for her professional pursuits and aspirations. During visits, young people move these peer relationships from the online to the offline world through face-to-face -face meetings. In Ghana, I have witnessed several planned and spontaneous first encounters with online peers. These encounters almost create a sense as if young people were living in Ghana, even though they had not lived there in several years, and some of them had never lived in Ghana before. This chapter brings out the experiences with people, but it also highlights how young people's engagement with space, um, it also highlights their engagements with space. Young people use their smartphones as a tool to independently move around the country, to book accommodation, or to navigate the, the unfamiliar urban landscapes. And this was not possible even a few years ago when young people had to rely on family members or other adults um, to navigate the, the country. All of these experiences have a lasting impression even after young people return to Belgium because they help to generate a sense of connection, confidence, and independence. These findings thus show that first, young people do not only continue their parental ties, but they create their own relationship to the country of origin. These relationships beyond the family sphere have not received much attention in previous research. Second, the chapter also shows the increasingly important role of the digital that, together with travel, contributes to young people's connection to the country of origin. And third, a trajectory approach that looks at mobility over time and as it happens also generates insights about how young people create, their, um, create a sense of extraordinary everydayness over time. So to conclude, the dissertation gives a detailed account of how uh, mobility throughout young people's lives shaped their transnational effective engagements. One important finding of the study is that it is crucial to consider all moves young, a young person engages in, not just the migration move, because mobility significantly affects how young people are faring. In this presentation, I have provided a brief overview of how mobility shapes the lives of Ghanaian background youth in terms of their experiences with family and family reunification, with personal growth, and in terms of their relationship with the country of origin. The mobility trajectory approach makes theoretical and methodological contributions to the study of transnational youth mobility. 
First, I include both the country of origin and residence. This provides a deeper understanding of the complexities of youth mobility and the ways in which different forms of movement impact the lives of migrant youth. And second, I use a, a mobile research design. Witnessing mobility as it happens in different contexts and over time allowed me to capture elements of mobility related to the senses and emotions that allow for a deeper understanding of young people's lived experiences. Thank you for your attention. And I'll give the word back to the prorector. Thank you so much for this presentation. And the opposition will now be opened by Professor Dr. Sally Wyatt, Professor of Digital Cultures at our Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Maastricht University. Thank you, Chair. Esteemed candidate, dear Sarah, I first knew you via your artwork and your contributions to the faculty's lockdown collections of art and poetry. And we can all see your artistic talents in this beautiful book and in the presentation that you've made just now. The illustrations and figures are of an incredible uh, aesthetic quality, and thank you for that. But moreover, it's very well written and based on thorough research, drawing on a, different, a range of different academic fields and using different methods. And you know, half of this during a pandemic, so congratulations. But I and the other committee members here today are here to ask questions, the final stage of your own particular PhD journey. So I will start um, by telling you a bit about myself. So I'm the child of English parents, and they emigrated to Canada in the 1950s to escape the dreariness of post-war England and its oppressive class structure. My grandparents were lower middle class, perhaps lower lower on my mother's side. My older brother and sister were born in England, but I was born and grew up in Canada. And when I was 20, I moved to England to do my master's degree. And I chose England at least in part because I thought it would be an opportunity to spend more time with extended family and my older brother who'd moved there a number of years previously. And even though I am white and by now pretty solidly middle class, the English have a special talent for reminding those of us from the colonies of our otherness and general inferiority. So this very short glimpse into my background I think raises a number of questions relevant to the work that you've been doing. I never, okay, it was a long time ago, but I never thought of myself as a young person with a migration background. Nor did I think of it as return when I went to England to study. And these are two, I think, really important concepts in your book. Um, and I would like you to say a little bit more about whether these are primarily sort of analytic concepts from you and the literature, or actors' concepts, and if the latter, what kinds of actors? So I have other questions related to my experience, but let's start here. Hmm. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for the compliments and also for your question. Um, before I start, would you mind repeating the last bit of your question? Sure, it's about whether those young person with migration background and return, which are concepts which come kind of repeatedly kind of in your text, are they analytic concepts developed by you and other academics, or are they actors' concepts, um, whether it's young migrants, their families, policy makers, teachers, um, and if they're actors' concepts, which actors? Mm. Um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for clarifying um, the question. Um, also in the in the dissertation, I mentioned in the beginning that um, yeah, there are categories um, how to classify migrants, but these are um, usually quite um, difficult. So it, usually categories of first generation and second generation um, are used that also are um, often racialized categories. Um, and in this dissertation, I also tried to problematize these types of categories um, by referring to the mobility that happens throughout the life course, um, which, uh, in my opinion, says more about um, the experiences, the lived experiences of young people rather than um, using such categories. Um, I still used the, um, a term of, um, of migration background um, in order to also engaged with the literature. Um, 
So, um, for example, in the, in this chapter um, where I talk about um, mobility of young people with and without a migration background, um, it was useful to make this distinction because usually in literature um, about migrant youth, th this is looked in a particular way. And by bringing these different um, types of um, young people into the same analytical framework, this was also useful to step out of the lenses that are usually used in research on on migrant youth or yeah, young people with a migration background. I hope this answers your question. Um, so yeah, so my experience, okay, it was a long, it was 40 years ago, is not unique. So many British people moved to the kind of outposts of the British Empire um, in the late 40s and 50s. And I was just wondering if you could perhaps say something, I mean, it would be another expansion of your methodological repertoire, but to compare the kind of experiences of that generation with contemporary experiences. And do you think that would tell us something different about colonialism and racialized categories and empire? Hmm. Um, you mean if I compare it in, in terms of what happened before and what happens now? Um, well, I th you mentioned also um, experiences of otherness and um, of, yeah, suggesting an inferiority. Um, and I, I can say that in the context of this study, um, these experiences or yeah, discriminatory experiences were also part of the realities of young people. So there was still, um, yeah, an, an othering that was going on, which in addition, as you also mentioned, um, you are white and this is also, um, a, yeah, a racialized othering in this case. Um, so I'm not sure it is um, different in, in that sense that an othering takes place um, and still takes place. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Versrache, Professor of Sociology, University of Antwerp. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Esteemed candidates, dear Sarah, I would also like to compliment you with your excellent thesis and also with the clear presentation that you've just given. Um, I think your thesis is great work, firstly, because it's, of course, uh, a traditional, tightly argued academic thesis, meaning that it's clearly structured, embedded in relevant theoretical literature, and it gives precise answers to a couple of Good, good formulated uh, research questions, and this is something that I obviously appreciate. But what I appreciate even more uh, is that, secondly, your empirical research has really taken serious the, the mobility stern um, in migration research. And probably not everybody present here in, in the public realizes how demanding it is to do 18 months of multiple sites ethnographic field work uh, to trace the mobility trajectories of, of the 25 people that you have followed, and then to make sure that all the different data that come out of this, ethnographic notes, interviews, but also the mobility tracking tools uh, that you have uh, developed, and to make sure that all these different types of data gel together in a coherent um, dissertation. Um, and I think, uh, or I know that this requires a long period of hard work. And indeed, I also think that you have managed to produce a very pleasantly coherent uh, thesis on the basis of data. So I would like to congratulate you for this. But obviously, my role here is not to applaud you and your work, but to ask uh, a couple of critical questions. Uh, so that's what I will do now. Um, and I have a rather broad question about about the theoretical framing of your thesis and it contains some more specific sub questions um, as you have already explained you have used two main bodies of literature or two theoretical lenses uh, i think you, you use this term um, to frame your research the literature on on transnationalism and and the one on mobilities and i think you explain well why you have selected these lenses and what they allow you to see and what this contributes to the debate, so I won't ask any questions on that. But what struck me while reading your thesis is that you do not mention even once another body of literature that I would also consider to be highly relevant for your topic, 
and that is the literature on cosmopolitanism and more particularly the sociological anthropological literature to uh, or approach to everyday cosmopolitanism because this is exactly about the type of persons that you have been studying highly mobile young people who are open to other cultures and through their mobility acquire the competence to mediate between different cultural spheres so to say so my more specific questions uh, here are firstly whether you have indeed considered to engage with this literature on everyday cosmopolitanism and if that's the case why you have decided not to deal with it uh, secondly i would also like to ask you whether you would consider the 25 young people or at least most of them to as cosmopolitans um, and thirdly i would like to ask you what you think about one of the central theses in the social scientific debate on cosmopolitan attitudes and that is the argument that cosmopolitan attitudes are shaped through increased transnational experiences and contexts because this seems to be relevant for your topic indeed so three sub questions but you can you can pick and choose the ones that you like most let's say Highly esteemed opponent, um, many thanks for the compliments and for your three questions. Um, I think this is an interesting question, and um, I, in, yeah, it's true, I do not engage with the literature on cosmopolitanism. Um, the reason I engage with um, theoretical ends um, was to include um, not only multiple contexts, but also to um, be able to consider um, context-specific norms and practices that further shape um, the, yeah, the, an understanding of young people's experiences. So this, for example, includes also um, family norms on like, extended families, social parenthood, that are really important in order to understand these experiences, especially as I show in, in Chapter 5 on family reunification. Um, and you, you mentioned that the cosmopolitanism cosmopolitanism literature um, relates maybe more to the mobility lens in the sense that um, yeah, young people are quite mobile. Um, yeah, I think this is an interesting question also to take on in the future. Um, and I'm not sure I would, um, I, I specifically look at the mobility in this dissertation that also um, goes to the country of origin. So while some of the young people also had other mobility experiences to other places um, in like North Africa or the Middle East, um, and this maybe relates more to what would refer to cosmopolitanists that um, traveled widely and also to different regions in the world, I probably would not say that this was the case for all of the participants in the sample. So in that case, it might not be fitting to, to use it here. Um, but in terms of the transnational experiences, I think it, yeah, it is interesting um, to consider. But yeah, for the, for the purpose of this thesis, yeah, I have not considered it yeah, be because I mainly look at the connection between Belgium and Ghana. I hope this answers your question. Okay, thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Ruth Chung Chudge, lecturer in Human Geography, University of Liverpool. Hi, Sarah. Um, thank you so much uh, for your presentation and your thesis, which I very much enjoyed reading. Um, so the thesis paints a vivid picture of how much uh, your young participants enjoy leisure and forging peer relationships around visits to their countries of origin. And I think this is one of the most novel and uh, exciting contributions of the thesis to think about these as uh, new expressions of transnationalism um, that go beyond the kinship relationship. Um, however, we also know um, that the post-colonial inequalities between Europe and Africa are still very stark, 
and these shape power relations, not only globally, but within diasporas. So um, I, I wanted to ask whether you could comment um, on how post-colonial power relations, um, for example, differences in economic resources, but also imaginaries and perceptions may have played into um, the senses of pleasure, um, romances, friendships, uh, and senses of personal growth that your participants experienced. And extending that um, into kind of the implications, um, what do you think the implications are for how we understand these novel forms of youth transnationalism? So are they transnationalisms of consumption, the homeland as playground, or are they uh, spaces of emerging new solidarities beyond kinship or something else? So we'd just love to hear more about your thoughts on that. Esteemed opponent, um, thank you for your question. Um, I would first like to, to mention that indeed um, many of these aspects of visits to the country of origin were related to um, pleasure, some of them also um, to consumption. Um, and in this dissertation, I focused more on, on how experiences in the country of origin then um, translated into um, yeah, benefits for, in terms of the personal growth. But it is also interesting to consider um, these other types of relation and how colonial, um, post-colonial ties also shape um, relations in the diaspora. Um, I think I sort of briefly hinted at um, these um, relationships in the dissertation um, and also the sort of the power dynamics that maybe take place across borders when I, um, in chapter seven on um, extraordinary everydayness, also refer to romantic relationships that, um, yeah, that happen across borders um, and how these might also be shaped um, more from someone in the diaspora or um, is more determined from someone in the diaspora and easily to cut um, yeah, without further contact afterwards. Um, but I would, what I would like to say is also that when young people travel to the country of origin, um, some of them also learned about um, or gained insight into um, like um, relationships that were shaped by these post-colonial um, relations. And that sort of made them reflect also on their own assumptions about um, Ghana, about the country of origin, um, and in, I would argue turn into a learning experience. Um, yeah, I think I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Roy Hausmanns, Associate Professor, International Institute of Social Sciences, Erasmus University of Rotterdam. Thank you. Um, thank you, dear candidate, dear Sarah. Um, thank you for having me read this work. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I think you've enjoyed doing the research, you've enjoyed writing it up, at least that's my sense, uh, the sense I get when reading it. It's, it's beautifully done. The art that's there on the screen is not just illustration, you actually use it to think with and you use it in your methodology too, so that's, that's I think quite unique. Um, so these are compliments I'm giving you. Um, but I, I do move to a question and I think my question relates to one of your key concluding points, huh? and I've written it down here. You, you made a point that's important to consider all moves. Um, I fully agree. No? But I think you might want to extend or nuance it, that's the better word, and, and say it's also important to consider um, moves not made or moves not realized. And that goes to sort of how you've built your, your argument uh, empirically. Um, there's, a, there's a quote at the start of page six that says almost half of migrant youth in European secondary schools visit the country of origin at least annually. Uh, at least once a year. If I compare that with your sample, 25, I see that's not true for your sample. Uh, only nine have ever uh, returned, um, or not necessarily returned, but, but um, visited Ghana. 
Um, so that's a little bit over a third. So my first, and that's a very simple question, I think, can you comment on this apparent divergence? How is there something special about this population or perhaps special about this uh, sample uh, that we need to know in order to appreciate your findings? Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for this question. And I think it's um, a good point that of these 25, only nine had made at least one, um, one visit to the country of origin. Um, and I think um, one reason for this is that the majority of my sample, um, 20 of these 25, were um, actually born in Ghana and moved to Belgium um, throughout, uh, yeah, in their childhood or their youth. Um, and the, which relates to the general, more general context of um, the, the Belgian field site, because the Ghanaian community in Belgium is also still a bit more recent than maybe in, in other um, countries, but also in, um, compared to other migrant youth in, who live in Belgium who are from uh, maybe more established um, communities. Um, and what I observed also in my samples that um, of these young people who were born in Ghana, um, many had plans to visit the country of origin, um, but did not do so for several um, reasons, because um, for some of them it was uh, important to, to save up more money first to go back. Um, and so they, yeah, they postponed these visits. Um, what I also observed is that for a lot of the, the young people in my sample who were born in Ghana, um, they actually first finished um, their um, an educational stage in Belgium before they made visits um, to the country of origin. And I think um, one of the reasons here that it, for some it, it did not seem possible to go before was that many young people um, worked um, to save up for, um, for some of these trips um, during the school vacations, um, but also in the way that the school system in Belgium is built up um, that um, because migrant youth are more um, disadvantaged and face more inequalities in the school system, um, it is also more likely that they received um, a so-called BEA test or SEA test at the end of the, the year, which means that um, if, they have to, if they want to fight this decision, it, they usually have to be present in Belgium um, and have to um, yeah, negotiate with the school, which also introduces more um, insecurities in terms of the planning um, beforehand but yeah, it might also have financial consequences if they have to cancel a trip. But yeah, I think for these reasons, um, there, it might be a bit of a discrepancy um, between um, like the Ghanaian community and the mobility and um, maybe other um, communities of migrant background in Belgium. Yeah, so the chair is nodding, so that means I can do a slight a quick follow-up question. Um, thank you, dear candidate. This is, this is a fantastic uh, answer, and I learned a lot by listening to you, so that's, that's well done. Thank you. Uh, follow-up. Um, so the majority in your sample did not make this visit, so could you elaborate a little bit more on what transnational effective engagement means for them, those who, for various reasons we now learned, uh, have not perhaps yet made this visit? Esteemed opponent, thank you for the follow-up question. Um, in this dissertation, in chapter two, I um, define transnational effective engagements both um, in, the, in the embodied and emotional sensory experience that young people make or have during um, their visits to the country of origin, but at the same time also um, these emotional connections that remain or that stay active across borders. Um, so it's not only um, that young people can um, yeah, contribute to or it can um, fashion these transnational effective engagements by visiting, although these, of course, contribute in a different way. Um, but young people who um, did not travel yet to Ghana, they also have family in the country of origin or friends that they stay in contact with, um, some of them that um, provide support. So the, they do have um, a lot of members in their transnational networks um, that, um, yeah, are emotionally, still emotionally close. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Dr. Hildegard Schneider, Professor of European Migration Law, the Faculty of Law, Maastricht University. Thank you. 
Yes, dear candidate, I would also like to join the others by congratulating. When I had the manuscript, I already really very much enjoyed the reading because it was so clearly written. But when I got the book, I especially enjoyed also the illustrations and how you integrated them in your story and the thing. So really a congratulations to both the manuscript as such, but also how you made it to a very interesting but also very stimulating form of total project. Gesamtkunstwerk, I would call it. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, my question is, and of course I'm a lawyer and a migration lawyer, so it's much more normative than perhaps the theoretical issues I have is, what can we do with it? Yeah? Because actually what you say is that in schools and educational system does not really stimulate the return. While, and here I come back a little bit to Professor Sally Wyatt's story, when I was at school, which is a rather long time ago, actually already in that time it was stimulated to go to the United States or the uh, United Kingdom because that was considered part of the personal growth of person. And so why does a system not stimulate the return to your roots, to your home country, or let's say at least to the origin of your family, while other mobility, and also in Belgium, is often stimulated? So what's wrong with the system? And when I, what I know from, let's say, and I must admit my, my knowledge on the Flemish system is not perfect, but what I know is, and it's also actually true for the Dutch system, is that the educational system is still living in a system of, mm, I would say, nearly the 50s or the 60s, where migration was a sort of one-way road and was considered the best is to do to integrate in the society of the host state and not to look back too much. While we are living in the 21st century, mobility is part of our life, it's transnational families, and the educational system has not adapted it, and political mind neither. So what do we, would you suggest if you are now telephoned by the Minister of Education in Flaadden, what would you say, what has to be changed in this system? Is it the teachers, the school, the educational system? What has to be changed to make it less discriminatory? And also, and it's also a losing for, I would say, not only for the children with a migration background, but also losing information and uh, important experiences for the children without a migrant background in a school system. So what would be your answer to that? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your kind words and also for this very important question to think about the broader implications of what we can actually do with the research results. Um, I think part of the, the problem is um, that the discourse on um, this mobility of migrant youth um, is quite negatively, um, and there's actually no research that shows that um, trips to the country of origin negatively affect young people, but still um, the general assumption is that it is bad for the language acquisition, emotional well-being, and also the educational performances. Um, so I think part of the solution would be to um, to change this assumption, um, and I think there's burgeoning research showing that not only the, the mobility of young people without a migration background can be stimulating and contribute to personal growth, um, but also um, the mobility of migrant youth. Um, so this, I think, is um, part, part of the solution. Um, the, the way that the system is now, it, it is uh, meant to, to penalize absences um, during the school year, um, but what happens because of the inequalities in the system is that it also affects um, travel at, at other times in the year during the school break. Um, but yeah, to, to change this, I think there, there are deeper uh, underlying inequalities in the system that um, yeah, also impact this and that needs to be addressed. And I think there is awareness of this, but I, I don't have any concrete solutions to 
um, to change this. But I think, uh, yeah, it is important to also change um, how we think about this mobility and show the, the positive impact that it can have on young people. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. We have time because you're very succinct. We have time for a second round and we give our invited guests the opportunity to start off this second round. And I will give the floor to Professor Verschagen. Yes, thank you. Uh, dear candidate, my second question concerns uh, your chapter six, where you focus on the personal benefits that the young people that you've studied gain from trips to the country of origin. So you argue, for instance, that uh, travel to the origin country helps them in cultivating self-confidence, uh, nourishing educational aspirations, and it also gives them a sense of possible pathways in life, particularly also mobile and transnational pathways. I'm not sure whether you write that literally, but I read it between the lines, so to say. I think this is a convincing argument but I would like to push you a little bit in further developing it by introducing the distinction between aspirations and capabilities, uh, which is, among others, used by the Dutch migration researcher Hein de Haas. And so what this distinction implies is that you not only have to look at increased motivation and increased aspirations, for instance, to be mobile or to develop uh, a career, because that's only one side of the coin, you also have to look at actual capabilities to develop, for instance, a transnational educational uh, career. Um, uh, for instance, people may aspire to develop such a career, but the question is, do they have, the, or they also need certain capabilities in the form of resources such as money, uh, social connections, specific knowledge, uh, cultural capital, etc., that you need to actually put this into practice. So my question is, can you refine the argument that you make in Chapter 6, but spell out how and to what extent the experiences of traveling to the origin country not only affect educational and career aspirations, but also their capabilities to put these aspirations into practice? Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for this question. Um, indeed, in the chapter, I uh, mainly focus on the aspirations and also argue that it would need to be researched over time um, to see how this actually um, translates in the future and what happens in the future. Um, but to reflect on the capabilities um, that young people need to also um, yeah, um, yeah, realize these aspirations, um, I think they do need resources and connections. Um, but what I also show throughout the thesis is that um, both through social media and these visits, they are able to make connections and also connections that can help them in um, their future or with their future pathways. Um, because these pathways that I describe in chapter six um, are, for example, um, diff different business opportunities that young people imagine that could um, yeah, take place in Ghana. So um, often these aspirations um, in terms of education actually took place in Belgium, but were useful in order to then um, translate this um, or yeah, transform their aspirations um, into, into actual reality. I mentioned, for example, one case who after these visits saw that um, touristic attractions are really successful in Ghana, um, which inspired him to um, to study um, international business in order to then go back to, to Ghana and um, yeah, establish a business on his own. So I, I do think that um, it is re realistic also in terms of resources. Um, some of the participants um, actually said that it is more realistic to um, open a business in Ghana because you need less resources than, if you, uh, yeah, than in Belgium if you would open, for example, a restaurant as one of the participants um, mentioned. So um, I do think that it's not only aspirations, but there's um, also the potential to um, translate this into um, reality. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That's, that was indeed also my sense when reading it that both dimensions are indeed present mm. in the chapter, but it's not yet spelled out like, as such, but this might be something for future research as you have su suggested yourself. Thank you. Thank you. We will now continue with Dr. Chung Judge. Thank you. Um, 
So one of the propositions of your thesis is that uh, studies of young people's transnational mobility benefit from multi-sided ethnographic research. And as we've all attested to, that's certainly uh, present in the richness of your work. It's a wonderful thesis in, in that sense and rich data. Um, but I was also intrigued by the fact that keeping in touch via digital media was an important methodological tool for you. And I think this methodological tool has a lot of relevance um, for us all in an era where uh, researchers face pressures on time and funding, uh, not to mention global pandemics, concern about climate change and all sorts of other jolly things. Um, so I wonder whether you could comment more on your experience of using these methods and what you think the possibilities, challenges, and ethical questions are around doing research about young people and transnational mobility through um, digital methods, such as using WhatsApp, social media, and so forth. Esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for this question. Um, yes, I did stay um, in contact via um, digital media with young people um, throughout the, the research. Um, and I think it was a useful way um, also to remind people or um, yeah, to, to follow up, um, because also sometimes I, I left the field for some time. Um, so it was important to keep these relationships um, alive. Um, what um, I show in the dissertation is um, also the, the importance of the digital for young people and in their lives. But it was something that actually uh, emerged only later in the field, um, in what ways also dig the digital is important for young people. So I did not um, go in depth and, and use um, data on, um, that I collected on, for example, different social media platforms. Um, it was more that I observed um, these interactions between the, the online transnational peers and young people in Ghana. Um, and what I did do via social media is, um, is yeah, I, I gained an impression, I think, of a different side maybe of young people. And that helped to um, yeah, paint a fuller picture um, of the experiences or things that might be important to young people. Um, I think it is um, yeah, it has real potential to use this even more, also considering um, the role it has in young people's lives that I show in, in Chapter 7. Um, but indeed, there are some um, ethical challenge, challenges that also come with the use um, of, of such data. And I think the, the way I dealt with it was that I did not collect it as data, but um, only to stay in contact with young people in order to then in Within, with these in-person um, relations to yeah, keep them alive. And yeah, thank you, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you so much. We have time for yet another question by Dr. Roy Um Thank you, dear candidate. So I, I follow up on those digital dimension, but putting it into a different direction, and you can see a little bit how my mind works then, I guess. Um, so you, especially in chapter seven, you, you describe quite well how important the internet is for young people to build these, these networks and do this in fact effective engagement. And what is also important, you describe that these young people are doing this independently. They have their own accounts, not only their online accounts, but also bank accounts. No, so not in this thesis, but we know more generally that, that uh, the internet is not always good news for young people. Huh? I'm thinking about instances of digital online fraud, uh, money scams, and, and, and that sometimes is also transnational, as we know. So I can imagine, and this is how my mind sometimes works, that these young people may be quite an interesting target for these parties. So. Could you comment on that or perhaps how they think about it? Because I also believe that young people are actually quite aware of these potential risks. So how do they navigate these potential dangers and risks uh, independently as part of their digital um, effective engagements? Esteemed opponent, thank you for this question. I think it's an interesting question to consider, although I did not um, encounter any um, accounts of um, maybe the risks or potential transnational fraud that young people commented on. Um, 
I think the, the risk in, in the context of the, the chapters, chapter seven, were actually more related to um, sort of dis yeah, potential disconnections. Um, so what, what actually happens when um, young people do not have access to digital media when um, they, they travel in, in Ghana? Because yeah, as I described, they're actually quite re reliant on, on these tools um, to yeah, get around the country, to stay in contact. Um, and I thought this was quite interesting also during field work that um, yeah, you could, for example, see um, young people carrying around charges or extra power um, bias in order to be able to always connect. And um, I think in that sense, there were more risks in terms of that, the potential disconnections that might arise if we do not have access um, to the internet, um, rather than yeah, issues of, of transnational fraud, maybe. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a very simple last question. Um, could your highly esteemed supervisor, Professor Mazzucato, have done this work? Hmm? Does age matter? Um, so I'm really asking you to kind of, that's <laughs> why, why, we, why we have PhDs. Um, could you situate yourself more in the kind of choice of methods, your ease of access? And even though you are much younger than Professor Mazzucato, you are, I believe, older than many of your respondents. Um, and you say, you know, several times that you wanted to put young people at the center of your work, that this was something that had been missing on previ in previous research on migration and families. So, but yeah, do you have to be a young person to do this kind of work? And it also makes me wonder about what you describe as extraordinary everydayness. Is that only extraordinary for older people? Um, it sounds like it's really quite ordinary and normal for many of your respondents. So yeah, does age matter? Hmm? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for this question. Um, maybe to start with the, the last part of your question, um, is it really extraordinary also for young people? And I think this is a, a good point because I point out in this chapter seven that um, it was actually not something that young people even commented on in um, interviews with me that they establish transnational peer relationships online and then go to Ghana and see them for the first time. And I would have actually missed this um, if I had not traveled with someone to Ghana and, and asked, okay, who is this person? And the participant said, well, I also am meeting him for the first time, but yeah, we've known each other for five years. Um, so it was not something that was commented on as extraordinary. By, um, by the research participants. Um, so that means that I would say that it is extraordinary, not only um, in relation to my own experiences, but also in relation to what we can find in the literature, um, because yeah, previous research um, only focus on the, the maintenance of family relationships. Um, so in that sense, it is quite extraordinary to see that not only um, do young people form connections to um, peers that are beyond the family sphere, but then um, also do that online. Um, and to, to come to, the, to your um, other question, um, in terms of how um, age matters, um, and uh, yeah, as me as a researcher, um, and I, I do say in the dissertation that I was most, um, in most cases, I was quite substantially older than the participants in some cases, a, a twice the age. So there was, of course, a difference. Um, and then depending on um, the, yeah, the entry channel that I used in the field side, I think it also shaped uh, in what way age was important. So for example, um, in schools, I think it was quite noticeable that I was perceived more as a teacher who, yeah, some of the teachers had the same age as me. Um, so there was a clear um, distinction or hierarchy maybe as well. Um, in other, in other contexts, the age did not matter as much. For example, in the church settings, um, I was not the oldest member of the youth group. Um, so yeah, I think there's also, um, it is quite relative in terms of how you enter. And then there's also other aspects of my positionality that, of course, shape the interactions um, with the young people. Um, I, I just wanted to add that in Ghana, um, 
this sometimes could also be turned around because I was quite inexperienced uh, in terms of the cultural um, capital or experiences that young people had and, and could in turn guide me in these contexts. So in that, for, in that context, for example, age did also not matter as much. Um, yeah, thank you. Sarah Anschütz, the time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee here present will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and of your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room.
Sarah Anschütz, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee here present has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Matsukato is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I thus invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Testing. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you Sarah Anschutz, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dr. Anschutz. <laughs> Dr. Anschutz. <laughs> Woo! Dr. Anschutz, Dr. Anschutz, Dr. Anschutz. <laughs> Dr. Anschutz. Can I call you Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> Dear Sarah, this PhD has been a long and wonderful journey full of surprises, at least for me. It is one part of a team act, the Motril team that consists of four PhDs, one postdoc, and an honorary member, Johan. It is the product of team science, in which together we built a research program on transnational youth mobilities, from theoretical and conceptual tool development to creating, um, to creating methodological tools, together analyzing field notes, discussing findings, and jointly co-authoring papers. But today is also testimony of your part in this teamwork. Our work is so integrated, I like to think of it as a theater play, a play in four acts. Each act has its own theme and main actor, but together with the other acts, it forms the whole story. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we have act one. And act one is called Sarah. I said this was a journey full of surprises for me. Let me start from the beginning. I had 200 applicants for this PhD position. Carlijn and I had a hell of a job going through all of them and selecting whom to interview, and we had set ourselves a limit of five. But at the last moment, we broke our rule, and we decided to interview six. And boy, am I glad that we did that. I remember our interview with you at Amsterdam Central Station. A shy woman walked up to us, but every question of ours was answered thoughtfully and carefully. And you left us the clear impression of someone who thinks deeply about things. And this is exactly how I came to know you, Sarah. Your quiet and thoughtful presence in our team gave our meetings a calm and stimulating character. From the beginning, you were eager to combine your training in psychology and anthropology into your thesis. Anytime you would propose a concept from psychology, you would do such a thorough job at providing the context, the definitions, the concepts, the theory that underlay this concept that you always contributed to the learning of the team and certainly to my own learning. Entering the field was a challenging phase of this research. 
you had to familiarize yourself with a new context, Antwerp, and try to integrate yourself into the Ghanaian community and the young people at that. Sometimes it seemed like it felt forced for you and that you had to really push yourself beyond and outside of your comfort zone. But then, and here was another surprise, in your usual calm and understated way, you impressed Noel and me with the depth that you were able to achieve in your interactions with the young people, the quality of your observations of their contexts, and the sophisticated thinking in your analyses. Noel and I were both amazed with what you could do with our comments. We would give you some pointers and some ideas for how to bring the story together, and you would go off, and your next draft, wow, another surprise. You did so much with the comments and more. Each and every one of, our pap of your papers makes an original contribution, not only empirically, which is already a contribution in and of itself, given the dearth of studies doing what you do, but also conceptually, from how to view family reunification from a youth perspective, to showing what a, per a, personal, lens, a, a personal growth lens uh, can contribute to knowledge about young people with a migration background, and finally, developing the concept of extraordinary everydayness that helps to understand how young people use social me media technologies and their travels to create their own transnational realities. Now, for a PhD, this is nothing but exceptional. And it is not only I who thinks this, but you've received recognition from other academics around the world in the form of having three published uh, articles and three highly regarded international peer-reviewed journals, and not to mention the co-authored chapter that we wrote together as a Motrail team, as well as the Finding Your Voice book that we produced together with a team of researchers plus the research participants. And I want to emphasize that this book, this one on Finding Your Voice, would not have been visually as appealing without your artistic work and creativity, which you can also see in your thesis and has been commented on widely today. I want to take this moment to also thank Noel for the wonderful contribution to this project, Noel. Noel, I took a bit of a risk asking you to be co-supervisor because we knew each other but not very well. Um, and yet, how many times during Sarah's uh, supervision meetings didn't, did we say, I completely agree. You after I made a point and me after you made a point. So, if anything, at least we, su we, we succeeded in not completely confusing Sarah by giving <laughs> contrasting <laughs> feedback. <laughs> um, but you also did more. You, um, you helped Sarah to come into your center, SEMIS, and also helped her with uh, Antwerp as a field site. So I want to thank you for this. Now, Sarah, a PhD, of course, involves struggles. My feeling is that you were always able to deal with them, and I know that some important people were also behind the strength, your strength. So the support from your parents, and also especially from your partner, Weil. <laughs> so I, Sarah, I cannot express how excited and honored I feel to be able to continue working with you in the year to come. And now I end on a cliffhanger. <laughs> because as I said, this is an, a play in four acts. And so for those of you who are curious to know how the story will end, you must come to act two on Wednesday, and act three on Thursday, and act four shortly thereafter. So Sarah, the cliffhanger, together with the Motrail team, this coming year, we're going to do something exceptional something that I've never done before. Come to act two. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Sarah. <laughs> Dear Dr. Anschütz, sounds fantastic. Also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with the honor that you have acquired. Congratulations and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. And now we take pictures on the stairs. <laughs>